now for, for quite a difference because John, John Leggett um, is from, 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 from industry. He is, in fact, the chief information officer and group vice president of British Petroleum. Um, I um, have known John for a, quite a long time now, and one of the things that he it seems to be doing all the time is flying around the world. And when I asked him um, about this, he, he actually feels that he lives in a global world, uh, from California to India to China to Russia, and he's worked in all those um, areas. And he also tells me that he, his inspiration comes from innovation, um, and he, um, he thrives from dislocation. And I think that will be, <laughs> that's a very good entry for his um, presentation, and he will talk to us about what did the internet ever do for us. Thank you, John. Good. Thanks, Eve. <coughs> I'll just check this microphone's working reasonably well. Um, I have no slides. I have a few notes to talk to. I've chosen to title this talk, uh, What Did Internet Ever Do For Us? And for those maybe who are English, might know where that quote came from, what the source may be. But it does come from Monty Python film, uh, the, the, the Life of Brian, made in 1979. Uh, and I want to bring you to that because it really, the quote was, What Did Romans Ever Do For Us? And this was a, a biblical story, basically. Uh, when the Romans were in power, and if like the insurgents were having a debate among themselves as to what the Romans did for them. And it's a, quite a long story, but I managed to abstract from the net uh, a few words from scene nine, uh, in, in which the first question was, what did they ever do for us? And the answer was, well, the aqueduct. Yes, the aqueduct, that's fine. How about uh, sanitation? And so the list gets quite long, and eventually the debate's going on what the Romans ever do for us. And in, in the end, it became sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, freshwater systems, public health. But the question was, and then what did they ever do for us? So I want to go back to that notion uh, in the context of the internet. And I said internet and Moore's law and put them coupled together. Uh, because my concern in this matter is we take it for granted now. And quite people might ask, what did the internet ever do for us without fully appreciating the things that have come to pass in the last 10 years and maybe come forward in time from that? So you might say regarding the internet and more particularly Moore's law, what has it ever done for us? Uh, well, apart from the obvious, the email and wireless uh, systems and entertainment and DVDs and all the things that you see around you almost in everyday life, uh, the genome project itself couldn't have happened without the effects of Moore's law. Uh, and if people think back far enough to the Club of Rome report uh, reg regarding energy supplies in the late 60s, you will remember that gloom the gloom and doom merchants had a viewpoint that 30 years was the expanse of oil and gas back in the late uh, 60s. So you might say, come to that theory, it was all gone by now. Uh, but in fact, I would argue that Moore's law has helped to extend, for a long period of time, oil and gas reserves in the world. They were always there, but the technology by which you find them, discover them, required the evolution of very, very high technologies driven fundamentally by Moore's law. So you, you can track this and say, actually, you have to look quite hard, but if you actually get behind the scenes, you can say that Moore's law has driven many things. And I want to bring that back to my own job and bring it into the nature of complexity uh, because I'm not an academic in this area. I have been to many sessions with Eve and understand broad principles. But in the context of BP, for those who don't know it, it is one of the top five corporations in the world and has grown more than double its size in the last five years by acquisition uh, across the world. And so we have, in ordinary language, a very complex environment. As CIO, I have everyone's stuff, I have every variety of unstructured data, systems, and so on around the world. And one of the jobs I have to do is to look three to five years out. That's my job. Uh, 
And so in the current planning cycle, in looking three to five years out, and I'll call it, uh, in simple terms, a thousand days from now, the way we analyze that is to look a thousand days behind to try and look a thousand days forward. And I'll just take you into a viewpoint in the last thousand days that we've all experienced. And you know, in the last thousand days, uh, we've seen two wars, Iraq, Afghanistan. We've seen 9-11, uh, Bali, and Madrid. You have to think quite carefully. This notion of a thousand days for me, you can spot many dislocations that were not predictable in the previous set of events. Uh, a level of technology, uh, issues like open source Linux, a thousand days ago, wasn't around. Now it's completely endemic everywhere. Uh, the wireless technology 802.11b, which is everywhere now, including people's homes, Starbucks, hotels, you name it, it's everywhere. And a thousand days ago, it was a glint in the eye of people in the suburbs of Helsinki. It was going nowhere. Suddenly it got to be endemic. And then in January of this year, in Vegas, they announced WiMAX, which is the next generation. So it's come from nowhere to be endemic, and yet the next generation has shown up. And we'll then dislocate that and we go from 11 megahertz bandwidth to 60 megahertz up to full-scale systems in the next thousand days. So I'm inquiring into this time period, not just technically, but politically. And so we come across quite a few uh, edge-wise events that don't normally occur. And I use that kind of analysis to help me think about the nature of dislocations in the thousand days yet to come. Now, where we need some help, and uh, Bob showed his slide um, around what might come next and how might complexity theory help. I think the big question I suffer from isn't the question of uh, innovation, because there's plenty of innovation in the world. My question is more about adoption. And, and that didn't appear on the slide, but I think actually that's at the heart of the question. So uh, in my business, apart from looking forward to and trying to speculate about world events, uh, and technology shift. In addition to that, since it all changes, technology is changing, you could say every 18 months at least, the new stuff dislocates the old stuff as well. It makes it of yesterday. So we spend uh, a fair bit of time scanning the horizon, uh, politically and technologically. And we do that in many ways. Um, and we do scan, and I call it looking for weak signals from the edge. And we look for correlations between, and they may be more intuitive than numerical, around when we pick up messages in California and a similar theme emergent in China, you have to start to say, ah, this could be something that's on the move here. There's something happening here. And I think the art of the CIO, the job I have, is to find these new futures somewhat ahead of the competition. That is always the art. When it becomes general, it's of no business consequence. You actually have to have it six or nine months ahead of anybody else to leverage that as a value proposition. So part of a lot of my work in Eve Comet is traveling around the world. And I will tell you, I used to always go during the dot-com era to California, where the action was. I still do that. But in going to India, I find all kinds of things of great interest. And then most recently going to Kunming in the far west of China, which is, as it were, in cultural terms, as Tulsa is to New York, Kunming is to Beijing. It's got that sense to it. Uh, and I went there in November. And it's completely wild. A totally remote community, in a sense, million people city. The airport is wireless. The hotels are broadband. You know, much more than most of Europe. And you start to wonder, looking at these other areas for a sense check, it's not simply going to come from sources of tradition. So part of the issue of being a global citizen or observer is to actually be able to scan many horizons. And again, I think there's a role here for complexity work to start knowing how do you scan effectively, having scanned for these weak signals, how do you get the business information that takes that to the notion that this will scale and be a force in the world in time to come. And what I want to do here is just point to a few things that I see 
and we see as ideas are emergent, not politically, because that's a different domain, but at the level of technology. And so things that I would uh, point to, I mean, during the last 50 years, the globalization trend is endemic, and you have to say over the next thousand days, more of the same. Uh, though having spent many weeks in the US recently, it is a, a hot topic. I think in the broad sense, it is unstoppable. It has to be dealt with and managed very effectively, and Tony Blair's been quite clear about that too. This is an issue that will carry on, and now and again, people will interrupt that flow of logic, but the processes of the emergence of China and of India are really quite remarkable. So globalization we see is just an endless trend over this period, and that will turn up, particularly in Russia, new skill sets, new capabilities, new competencies that we haven't yet fully understood. So looking along that track, we see that changing landscape more connected, more global. Um, the issues that we also see, uh, there's a phenomenon which people are aware of called uh, RFI tagging, which may sound like a sm simple and small thing. Uh, they are extraordinarily small, it's the generation beyond barcodes. And we looked into this two years ago as a new idea. Within the last year, Procter & Gamble, I think, have just ordered uh, 500 million RFI tags. So they are like little barcodes that go on CDs, go on whatever else. Our broad view is three to five years from now, the world will be endemic with, with tagging. Every item of clothing, books, papers, whatever will be tagged. That's the technological perspective. It's all possible that down will come down to a cent a piece. The question is the unintended consequences of that. The issues of personal privacy. They start then to become enormous. So again, you have to be careful that when you pick a notion that a technological trend line will carry on unimpeded, that at some level it bumps into humanity. And so this tagging phenomena, and I saw uh, when we started this about two years ago, it was nothing, became something. I went to visit with Amex six months ago to look at their newest uh, credit card, which has got an embedded uh, uh, RFI tag. I go to Singapore and I find it in Starbucks. So it's gone from an idea to something to being deployed in a different way uh, in no time at all. But it does have this unintended cost. So we see that issue is one that's just big for us. Cyber terrorism, you can look at the data, is increasing by the month and by the year. What impact will that have on the world? I didn't mean viruses per se, uh, and it goes from individual actors to state actors and all that sort of area. So again, big corporations have to think quite carefully about the whole issue in a wide sense of the confluence of physical and of cyber security. And again, it's a big issue for corporations to think about quite carefully. So looking down the next thousand days, I would say big corporations like BP and others see these technologies coming in. But the trick isn't to think you have the answer having done the plan, but then to go into alert mode on your scanning process, which is what we do, and we shape a framework and then we scan endlessly. But I must say the tools we use today are more about human intuition about the signals as opposed to using modeling techniques to try and come to a scientific and technical view as to what will uh, be the say-so at that time. So if I did stand in a place and ask five years from now, say 10 years from now, what did the internet do for us or what did Moore's law do for us? I mean, we can see already the issue of pilot aircraft being pilotless. The so-called drones have emerged. How soon will civil aircraft be pilotless? I have no idea, with time. Um, the issue of, we see emergent uh, called power at the edge is a new thing and we can't decode what that means. And let me give you the example of power at the edge. Socially, it became an issue that Rumsfeld's written about in the Afghanistan war. So traditional wars have the various command structures report back centrally, that's what they do until Afghanistan. During Afghanistan, people on the ground using mobile radios were then able to cross-communicate and not use any of the vertical channels back to the hub, back to the Pentagon. And this has changed warfare 
and so the power of the intelligence lives peripherally. What does that mean for command structures? Again, I'm talking in the US about that. What does that mean for command structures in the military is a big question. What does it mean for corporations in the world of post sarbanes Oxley when they may predicate a world of regulation and rigor that the modern trend may be more power, more intelligence at the edge? How do you manage that phenomena and yet have appropriate controls to meet the SEC? Tricky thing. So we see the advance of regulation also being something to think about in that world. So from my point of view out there, we can ask that question. And I just want to come back now and say, if we had this conference to celebrate 30 years, not 20 years, the Scientific Institute, and you were able to look back, the question might be, you know, what did complexity theory ever do for us? I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Today. You're very kind. Thank you. Special for today. Thank you. Um, no, we, yes, Pierre Paolo, please say who you are and where you're from again. I'm from the University of Durham in In biology, there's a concept that goes by simply good, adaptation, which means something could be pre adapted. Right. Also in a context that could be pre adapted to, to play a function of a bit different context. Flying, for example, it seems to be. For me, that, that, I think I could play that back against uh, Brian Arthur's work on the path of theory of evolution. And I think you have to actually think quite carefully whether there are um, like embedded opportunities whose, whose time hasn't yet come. And the issue is what makes them spring alive? They've been dormant, as it were, uh, and they are available, but when the confluence of business need societal trends make them uh, appropriate, then they become emergent. And they go from being, as it were, a low-level event to something that actually sweeps the world. Uh, so we're quite thoughtful about how do you detect the things where there's a bias for uh, those adoptions. Again, we don't know. We, we're quite interested in exploring that area and maybe learning from biology. It might be the right place to look. Brian, then here, and then Deborah. Yes. I think the glib answer is people. <laughs> uh, but that's a, it's a much deeper thing. Um, and you can find many examples of that. Uh, and so when we try to do adoption at scale, in a corporation of our scale, I'm always looking to drive something. If you've read the book, The Tipping Point, you'll find that sort of notion in there. And when we look at things that are bubbling along, the issue is what does it take to construct a tipping point? So we often look at technologies and trends and say, well, if we can't contrive a tipping point, we probably make it, nothing will happen because it stays in that zone where it can always fail. It bubbles along going nowhere. Uh, and you have to ask the question, if, if there's a business purpose, can you drive it up like that? So we actually, in terms of experimentation, our model is to scan the horizon and say in a typical year like last year, we might look at about 80 potential innovations. Then we get that down to typically about 10 or less that may have a business purpose. And then we often pilot in remote areas away from the center and to see whether they actually start, it's almost like doing some quiet tests to see whether in some particular circumstances this thing will spawn, this will grow. And so often they die. And then and the, and the job then is to know when to quit 
not to keep nurturing these little babies just in case they come good, is, is to move on. But then when you find things that do make business sense, then we do a number of things. One, we then look for another bigger scale example to go. And two, to build, you might call it the business case for, other people might call it the mythology about. Storytelling happens in organizational terms to be quite an important technique. You can publish the documents, but it's how the, the folklore spreads about success is quite an important thing. So we do quite a lot to propagate the, once we sense this is the right thing to do, we propagate quite hard and back up with the storytelling, the business case, and, and fill the world with that. So that becomes the way to do it. But it's more of an art than a science. I think that's a beautiful example, actually, both of, first of all, actually seeing the new pattern yeah. and then exploring the space of possibilities because what you call tipping is in fact doing precisely That's that right. the, the, the combination of those two mm. yeah. thank you and we haven't had any chance to to talk about politics yet but i'm sure there must be politics in sfi and everywhere and the difference between innovate or the you know the creation of the innovation and the adoption of the innovation um i, I have tried to analyze uh, i'm not saying that the creation of the innovation is politics free uh, i'm sure it's a lot of politics there but there are a huge amount of politics in the adoption phase so if you then uh, i found that you can roughly uh, I liked your uh, way of analyzing, but can I just offer another way of analyzing that there are roughly five phases of adoption. The first is, and they're all political, they're, they're all right. a political, each is a political process. The first is the um, knowing about, people right. got to know about it, and that's political. Mm. They've got to want it, that's even more political. Right. And then they've got to have it, and that means someone has got to allocate resources Indeed. in order to have it, and <laughs> allocation is politics end to end. Um, and then once you've, you've created the circumstances in which you can have the innovation, God willing, um, politics willing, then you, oper you put it into operation or you put the legal thing into the law and then you find it doesn't work. Uh, so you've got to put more politics in to the next phase, the fifth phase is to making it work. So can I just make a simple point? Because we haven't had much of it yet, even when our first speaker was talking, he dodged away from the politics of you know, why, uh, why the in in inoculation didn't take place. He did, oh, you weren't here yesterday, perhaps, I don't know. But, I didn't catch that, no. You know, that, that, um, you know, that, so we, have, we are politics free so far. Can we put some politics in? Let, let, me, uh, let me build your point, because you. you're, you're Methodist. Let me give you an example, and I won't name the particular department of government uh, in which this story resides. Uh, but a big department in the UK have what I would call a tethered computing environment, mm -hmm. i.e. you've got to be at a desk to do your business. That's where the computers live. Now, the world I live in is fully mobile. It's wherever you're at, you're there. And they've struggled with the politics. How do you move from that previous generation to something else? Uh, and, and sitting in meetings, I think another aspect of the innovation, apart from politics, is insight and championship. So in a room like this, we could talk, if it's a, a political meeting, you could use NHS or any of these bodies who've got a particular point of view. But in the room, if someone of some either significance, leadership-wise, but an activist at least, says, you know what, we are going to change how we do this business today. The insight of a different world order, actually itself, can then change the order. And I've seen a number of events where we've had big meetings about change in government organizations, including in the US, where nothing's going on, like it's the way it is. But eventually when you find able to tap into one or two individuals, they then become embedded and they can work away, I would say in a covert way, inside the structure to bring about change. So I, we spend a lot of time identifying leadership and activists <laughs> that we go to to help the innovation be propagated. That's another part. Mm -hmm. Right. So back in the theme of innovation and adoption, I 
guess my inquiry is how do you help very busy business leaders who are looking at finances and right. very well like mechanistic use of the world? How do we bring in principles around what we're hearing about in this conference into very pragmatic approaches? I'm just curious as to how do you, uh, yeah. what are the conditions in which leaders uh, speak? Um, I think well, an observation from my world, anyway, and I, I've been very thoughtful, even as I've been very thoughtful about the whole issue of the learning organization for well over a decade. And a very simple insight that I would offer, that organizations learn when they're in reflective mode. This sounds axiomatic, but actually it is vital. When you look at any business leadership team, they, are, they have enough work to do for the next thousand years. I mean, they've all got like that. So what we do, and we've done now consistently for five years, every, about once a quarter we take key leadership away for two days and have them in a space where they're confronted by dislocational thoughts. We had one last week in Miami. We brought people into that room that had nothing to do with business. They were to do it, but they created thought processes that were so able to dislocate the everyday that actually the new ideas became emergent. So we are quite artful about how we do these designs, it's just a reflective time into which you introduce ideas, not with an agenda called an outcome, the four key things, but let's listen to, let's visit with uh, the thought leadership, and we met last week uh, with people from the Department of Defense. Uh, from, we had a leading musician speak about the art of music making in the new age. And so in this team of BP business leadership, they were kind of in a space which was awkward because it hadn't got the usual business agenda. But out of that came a lot of, uh, a number of insights about how we actually make, can make more rapid progress and go after some things that will give us business differentiation to the competition. But it was in a moment of reflection by design as opposed to being at their desk doing routine business. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, bump into humanity was a, a lovely expression. Um, but the, polit the politics is very, very important. Mm. And I, I just want you to comment on the fact you and the other thing you said about um, contriving tipping points yes. and putting champions in. Right. Now, the point here is there's a difference between institutional interests, in this case BP, yeah. and humanities interests. Uh, right. Well, well, I can only speak in a BP context, so I can't speak more generally. Uh, I would say the contrivance is always for a better business out outcome. I mean, business in the round sense, either for the company for the employees or for society. And we actually operate in all three dimensions continuously. So we don't think, if like in a un unified way, that a monetary outcome is the only outcome. We, we've done a lot of work to change how people work, to give them more personal mm. flexibility. We've done a lot of work with NGOs. So when we're talking of innovation, it's not as simple as to get a higher margin on a barrel of oil. That would be a very simplistic story. We've done many things, and I'll give you an example. Yesterday, we were thinking of how do we, I was asked by people of some Caribbean islands with whom we do business, how can we leverage what you know into changing our society, our community? Not through what we know is the answer, but what innovation process have we used? And we do use quite a lot of what are called peer group methods to try and show people how we've got to where we are without being that an agenda of ours. But we are very careful, by the way, and I have lived in a place like Azerbaijan, you have to watch carefully yeah. the line between corporate roles and governance and the role of society. We are not and can never be a surrogate for proper government. That would be a wrong place to play from and we are extraordinarily clear <laughs> of that. Thank you. I have three. John, then you, then over here. Thank you. John? Yeah. Just a comment on Deborah's uh, question. In the board, uh, my experience is uh, I want no surprises. It's probably the keys. Yes. Well, that was a comment, John, rather than a yeah. question. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
Uh, well, we, we, I would say if, if I had anything about BP, I would say that's one of our endemic truths. Uh, I mean, clearly, other people would wish the same upon themselves at this time. It, it's a tough business. Uh, and one of the areas, again, mm -hmm. on the complexity theory, looking ahead piece, managing and leading at scale is a whole new task. If you look at the scale of corporations now compared with 10 years ago, the information flows are profound. And it, the surprise issue isn't about not knowing, but the sheer complexity of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So how do you mine these enormous mm -hmm. sources of data uh, so that people are not surprised, or the market's not surprised, not through morphisms, but basically because it's very tough in these complicated interactions always to get the right answer. Uh, so I'll say that was a, is a great motto, and I and absolutely hear it, but I look at the world we're in now at corporations at scale, and looking at the data flows from multiple business units across the world, and power at the edge, autonomous units, mm -hmm. you can be occasionally surprised if you can't get the signals from that early enough to be ahead of them. So it's a more difficult task than it was in earlier times, John, is what I would say to that. So the flip side is uh, that the signals are probably already there. The uh, they are maybe buried in a wealth of stuff. That's the issue. I think I'm going to walk carefully around that because uh, there are political issues around that. I mean, organizational political issues. Uh, first of all, BP runs in, in what we call a, a resource constrained model. So basically, in this whole space, you could spend a ton of money looking at everything. So you actually supply just enough money and people to scan and be tuned to what they need. So the scanning part is quite small. For me, it's roughly small numbers of people who are well connected to sources of where innovation may arise, intellectually or business-wise. When it comes inside the firm, you notice that sometimes it can go, and we've done quite a few projects to look at, I'd call the bell curve of distribution of things that are new ideas and how far they propagate. An observation we've got is the things that are propagated to the full extent ultimately have been mandated. The things that are free choice somehow make progress. And I'll give you a European example. They make progress in Belgium, but not Holland. There's a cultural question mark there. Eventually, if the corporation mm -hmm. says, and I'll use uh, some of it, this is the way it is, then it actually moves much more rapidly. So if you give people company in the company a lots of free choice about this, then it will make good progress. But to get it to be the complete solution mm. is another question. So in our world, in BP, what you often find is the cost and efficiency of having multiple solutions is a killer. So in a sense, we often have the old way that I've got the legacy way of doing business. Mm. And then there's innovation comes in. But if you layer the innovation on top of the old, that becomes a structural inefficiency quite often. So another thing we haven't talked about here is my whole agenda for decommissioning history. <laughs> so not only do we innovate, yes. we have a very action force around decommissioning history. And that's where the emotion kicks in. Because <laughs> that's what people love is, you know, I was asked a question many years ago, why do people fall in love with lines of code? You, I mean, uh, we, I tell the story again simply, when we changed 10 years ago from Apple-based computing to more generic, the most important part of the toolkit in doing that change was a box of Kleenex tissues for the tears. <laughs> the people were so wedded to that particular world that it was quite you know, amazing. So, so decommissioning history is another big conversation, but innovation on top of old stuff actually is usually a recipe for complexity and significant cost structures. Thank you.
Mm. How do you distinguish between the two, and how do you um, manage? How do you manage the uh, opportunities to your courses as opposed to and the opportunity? Yeah. Uh, uh, depending on which view, so you, in a sense, you have to be thoughtful about the things that are threats. And we do quite a lot. Risk management is one of our core attributes, and it's, more, it's not numerical. It's actually by you have to look at things that are risks to, say, a large-scale project. You're busy building it, uh, and then suddenly uh, something comes in that overtakes that as a trend line. Um, we have a recent example of, uh, of that. Um, I just find it interesting where if, if decisions are made locked in a certain paradigm and they haven't moved on, mm -hmm. then the future shows up. So recently, uh, ten, five years ago, we looked at one of our London buildings, our properties, and said, you know, this building must be sold because it hasn't got the floor space in which to lay in the cabling that modern computer-based companies need to have. And so the process runs and the building gets nearly disposed of. However, the model didn't allow for the fact that we are now in a wireless world where there are no needs for cables anymore, <laughs> right? So in a sense, you have to be all, so in a sense, these things like, what does wireless mean people's ways of life. So they've got a constructive piece and they've got a negative side. So if I take the case of how wireless is changing how companies work and people working in their home environments, so the good news is we can let people go with new computing to work in their homes rather than being offices. Then you lose the social construct. And that's what we're always looking for is what are the unintended consequences uh, there. And, and that's, that's quite hard to predict. Yeah. 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 Would you speak up? Yeah. Would you like to come up here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm climate, climate change. Where you go? Yeah. Well, let me go a little bit towards that. This is quite a delicate topic, but I'll, I'll, because I think Bob prompted it in, in his opening up. Uh, so John Brown gave a speech, I think it was May the 19th, 97, at Stanford, I think it was. And he had the same conversation about the nature. Is the data underpin Kyoto was the question. Does the science underpin it? I think in, John, in summary, John said, we don't know. Uh, all science is contingent, is John's remark. And then he stepped to the side and said, you know, however, we will adopt the precautionary principle. We don't have to wait till it's proven. Absolutely. But what are the things we could do now that may stop it getting worse? So we didn't get hung up on the proof has to be rock solid. We said we can stand aside from that model, whereas other companies were you know, the names saying, well, we are making no progress until the science is proven. And we said, well, maybe. But what a different model might be called, it'll never be proven sufficient. So just take some precautionary steps. And you, so that became, a, at one level, a threat called, can we respond to that? As opposed to then stepping to the science and saying, you know, our customers, our employees, want to work for a firm where our intentions are powerfully intended towards the environment. What's the upside of that? So we did take that one and work with it quite a lot, but we took the point of view, at least, that all science is contingent and precautionary principles are more predominant thought than waiting for the science to come good. Well, I think. Uh, 
Well, let, me, let me just put it this way. I, I did speak to uh, a fairly important CEO in, a, in the world about this issue. Because I mean, in the nature of things, surprises do emerge. So the remark that I got back was, you know, every day when I look in the mirror and shave, I know in this firm things will go wrong. It's like a statement of fact. However, the issue for leadership is the way they respond to that. And I think for me, actually, and we know that from various examples in the world where companies have taken time to respond, they've been stuck. So I think the issue is to acknowledge, do your best to manage out the surprises. I'd absolutely start from that place. But actually have the viewpoint, if you are an extensive organization, things at some level, in spite of the best of management, will start to go astray. It can happen. The issue is, first of all, to get the signal of that. So a cultural issue is that people should have to alert the system as early as possible. So keeping surprises buried is definitely, in our culture, uh, not a smart move. So bring it into the room and saying that we, we have a problem meeting our business targets this quarter. And then what I've noticed in BP and other companies, people gather around that and then bring other help to the table. How can you tap into the rest of the company to help solve the problem? So I think one is, first of all, to admit there's a challenge going on, and then to find out what resources you deploy to actually deal with that, whether it be the local unit or on a global basis. So I would say in the world of this great real complexity, um, surprises are inevitable. The trick is how you lead and then bring all available resource to that point and deal with it in an upright way. You done? Yes, yes, Kripa. <laughs> you started as you finished. Sorry, just to make sure. There's a point in what you were saying. When we do the formal strategy, either the business level or yeah. policy level, we, we usually follow uh, the type of approach with the problem, we have right. uh, some techniques, or tools, or frameworks, we have uh, some goals, we want to solve a specific issue. And we will uh, formulate that, that we have different sources of money, and so yeah. on. But we never take into account in the process of formulating the strategy or policy that we will never get the goal we want to get. We will get certainly some unintended consequences. And history of technology, either the level of invention, the level of adoption, is a history largely, not solely, of unintended consequences. Mm. So the problem is how do we change the strategy formulation or the policy formulation process in order to you know, embed this complexity view of the world? which will never get what we're aiming for Good. because we yeah. have to There are, I think, two parts to that. And there's not a, I won't use a flip chart to describe this, but there, there are two key points in what you just said. You could say that if you have strategies to develop, there are well-known MBA techniques, methods for doing that. Most people can crank the handle and get an outcome called this is how you do it. You apply resource, you apply people, you do it. The two parts that are quite important for me thinking about strategy. One is the thing that sets strategy is having a different level of insight from the competition. So upstream of strategy are insights. And actually, it's the insight about a market position, either in country or product, that drives the rest. So first of all, always being aware your strategy is driven from insights and knowing what the fundamental truths so we, when we do our work on strategy, not only do we develop the strategy, but I ask for even more work on the points of view that underpin that. Actually, what's the mental model that people have in developing a strategy? So, and most people get to doing the strategy and doing the outcome without fully appreciating the embedded logic. And so that's an area where we do a lot of work is to get what are the points of view, not truths, but points of view in that logic. So that's a piece of it. Then having, anyway, got the insights and got the strategy developed and the points of view, the model runs in reality, goes from thought to reality. And then I would say the issue then is to apply risk management. First of all, you assess what might happen, but you dynamically do risk management. So as you watch the outcomes, some people call this simplistically, you know, a do, learn, do model, that's rather simplistic. You, 
touch reality, the consequences, the unintended consequences start to show up, and then you modify that strategy. But it's not something done and finished. It's something that is running and then is open to events. And I think events pretty well drive the world. On that note, John, thank you very, very much indeed.